Welcome back to Milan Recording Studios. My name is James Pavel Shakras, and in this box right here next to me, I have what is most likely one of the most anticipated digital pianos, certainly of spring of 2020, but probably for several years. And that digital piano would be the Korg SV2. Ever since the SV1 release, certainly after a few years of it being out, many people were wondering when a second iteration of it would come along. The original SV1 was absolutely fantastic. I have owned one for several years, and it's easily one of my favorite digital pianos I have ever played on. I used to use it on a near daily basis, and still to this day, I will often use it from time to time and absolutely love it. So the SV2 was very much expected by the digital piano community. And finally, after over a decade, the SV2 is here. Now, this was actually very difficult for me to acquire. The SV2, the base model of it, either the 73 key or the 88 key, is a bit more readily available. The black version without the speakers can be found pretty much everywhere. But for some reason, and I'm not sure if it's an issue in the supply chain, that's probably what the issue is, or perhaps they're just being made in very limited numbers. The SV2S, the version with speakers and the cool um, cream finish on top, is much more difficult to come by. I originally first tried to get one of these at the NAMM show, but honestly, it's very difficult to get instruments at the NAMM show, so that wasn't able to happen. Immediately after coming back to the studio, I contacted a major national instrument dealer here in the United States. I'm sure many of you will know who I'm referring to there, and I tried to get a Korg SV2S through them. They were actually willing to do that, and they tried to do it, but due to unforeseen circumstances regarding this pandemic, basically their whole oper operation just completely shut down, and after a couple months of waiting, no SV2S came through, so I decided to cancel that. Then most recently, I have been developing this relationship with a music company up in New York, and actually they're mostly not known for music instruments at all, and they're more focused on other consumer electronics products. But they actually happen to have a small division of their company that's devoted to musical instruments, and digital pianos are in that sector, and they actually happen to have access to three Korg SV2s. They 88s version so they let me know that they had three of them in stock so obviously i said yes i want to buy one so i purchased this instrument with my own money that has been earned through the youtube channel thank you all so much to all of you guys who watch the channel and follow it on a regular basis it's thanks to you guys that i'm able to afford awesome instruments like this so the SV2S, or the SV2SP, or the SV288S, as it's known on this box, is a very interesting instrument, and I'm super, super stoked to get this box open and talk about it. Now, before I decide to get this open and play it for you guys and show you what it's all about, there's a couple more things I wanted to talk about, and one of those is price gouging. This is not a cheap digital piano, but it's also not on the higher end spectrum of the market. I mean, I'd say it is on the higher end spectrum, but as far as prices are concerned, it's actually pretty mid-range. On the highest tier, you have things like Nord and Dexibel that make instruments that reach almost $4,000. And then on the bottom end, you have things like, you know, the ES-110 or the P-125 or the Roland FP-30, which are under $1,000. This is somewhere in the middle, and prices do fluctuate. And they fluctuate a lot, specifically with the SV2S. For some reason, I've noticed many eBay sellers are actually, they have access to these, or they think they will have access to them, and they are hiking up the prices. I've seen prices for these ranging up into over $3,500, which is way more than the SV2S should actually go for. Uh, I paid about half of that price, half of around $3,500, which I think is what the SV2S is meant to retail for. Hopefully none of you guys have actually paid $3,500 or more more for an SV2S because I think that price is a bit too high. The other thing I wanted to talk about is the unboxing. A lot of the times with these digital pianos, when I get them into the studio, I will unbox them and show you how they're laid out in the box. That's actually not going to be possible with this because like Roland, Korg has decided to go with a box that opens on the top and on the bottom. So the way this is in here is you open up either side of this and then the keyboard will drop inside and lift out. That's going to be not really easy for me to show at least with this setup. So instead I'm going to unbox this instrument and just put it on the keyboard stand and show you guys how it looks then. I don't think that the unboxing experience, and I'll give you more details later on when I get this unboxed for sure, but before before I unbox it, I don't think the unboxing experience will be as good as with other instruments I've reviewed so far. When I got it here at the studio, I noticed things seem to be flopping around and shifting, and when I tilt the box even just a little bit, I can feel things moving around in there, so I'm not sure what's going on there. And the box honestly isn't in the greatest condition. Obviously, wear and tear will happen during shipping, and honestly, the overall damage is pretty light, but it does seem to be rather weathered and 
and be and battered and beaten so it's almost like it's been just sitting around for several months even though it's a brand new unit so that's also kind of interesting but i think it's time that i unbox the cork sv2 i will do that off camera and then when i come back i'll just have it out of the package and ready to play so let's go do that the SV2 is the successor to the original old SV1, and obviously since I own both of these now, there definitely will be a review and comparison of the two coming out in the future. So if that sounds cool, you definitely might want to stay tuned to the channel and subscribe if you're not already to be notified when that video comes out. These two have a lot of things in common, but they also have many things that are different as well. And of course, in that video, the comparison, I will go in depth and compare all of the differences and the similarities between the old SV1 and the new SV2. Let's get on with the actual review of the SV2 now. The SV2 definitely has a unique, I guess you could say a polarizing appearance that definitely leaves a mark and an impression on anyone who sees it. I know that there are a few people who don't like the aesthetic of the new SV2, they find the cream color to be bothersome, and I guess the speaker grills give them a bit of trypophobia, but I personally think that the SV2 looks really, really fantastic. Those speaker grills are unique, there's nothing else on the market that has that appearance, and the cream color, I think, looks really, really fantastic. The original SV1 was very unique, and there was is really nothing on the market like it, which is why for 10 whole years it really held its own, and even still to this day it does hold its own against modern digital pianos. And the SV2 kind of takes that to a whole new level. Many things are changed, and as I mentioned, I will be doing an in-depth review of the two, but many things are changed, and many things are actually better, of course, on the SV2 than the original SV1, and one of those, I think, is the visual appearance. Now, the non-speaker variant of the SV2 looks nearly identical to the SV1, V1, but it's the SV2S that has the cream color and the cool speaker holes that make it look really, really unique. There's a few things I want to talk about that come with the SV2 before I get into the way it works and the way it sounds, and one of those is the music desk, which I have hiding behind me over here. This is the music desk. Now, actually, this is the one that came with my SV1, but the one that comes with the SV2 is identical. It slides into place right here. There's two little spots for it, and I think that's really great. Some digital pianos these days from certain brands don't even come with a music band, and some of them don't even come with places to put one. Um, but the Korg SV2 comes with a music stand and a place to put it, which I think is pretty great. And when the music desk is not there, it's not really even all that obtrusive. The little spots where it goes aren't really that ugly. So let me take this back out again, but you can see that it looks pretty nice there. And it definitely does do the job. Now this does have a little bit of flex to it, but honestly, I've never had any issues with it whatsoever. Let me set that back down behind me. And then the other thing I wanted to talk about that comes with the SV2 is the pedal unit. Let me grab that real quick as well. This is Korg's pedal unit that comes with the SV2. As you can see, it says Korg embossed in black on top of the pedal unit. And it honestly, it's pretty adequate. I do think it could be better, to be honest with you. The underside of it has kind of this cheap, chintzy, plasticky, hollow look, and the overall feel of the pedal is rather cheap. The biggest problem with it, though, is the fact that these feet are made of foam and not rubber, and as a result, it tends to slide across virtually every surface you put it on. I think it's all right on carpet, but most other things, it really likes to slip and slide all over the place. It wouldn't be difficult to rip these out and put rubber feet in, which would definitely make an improvement. So I think if they originally, it does actually have a little bit of rubber down here, but I think if everything was nice, thick, grippy, sticky rubber on all all four feet and in the middle I suppose as well then it would be a much better pedal however it does do the job and it is adequate and it does work as a pedal unit but I do think it could be improved upon Another thing that comes with the SV2 is an owner's manual, of course, but there's actually a bit of a catch to it. This thick, chonky book here is actually a quick guide, and it isn't actually a full-blown owner's manual. Having said that, it is a very thorough quick guide. It's very easy to read, it's very easy to understand, and it comes in about six or so, seven different languages, which is really fantastic as well. And it's very easy to use and very easy to understand. Now, Korg does have a full-blown owner's manual available online, and you might be wondering why they didn't include it in the box most companies do these days. Well, part of the reason is because it includes a lot of full color pictures of the SV2 online editor that might not come through well printed out on paper. And also the user interface of the SV2 is so simple that it really doesn't need a full blown in-depth manual to talk about how to use the instrument. There are a few features that are hidden in the quick guide that aren't mentioned there that are mentioned in the full blown manual, but the overall user interface of the SV2 is really, really simple. Let me give you guys a close-up of that and show you some of the features about it. 
On the left here, you can see we have the master volume and the equalizer as well as the tube that powers the SV2 as well. It doesn't power it, but it does help to kind of shift some of the sounds and give them a warmer color. At least that's what Korg says. And many of the sounds are pretty warm, so honestly, I do believe them. It does also get pretty warm to the touch. The equalizer is pretty self-explanatory. That on and off button to the left of them turns the EQ on and off, and you can use the knobs to adjust it. To the right of the EQ is the pre-effects. These, these buttons basically are different effects. You've got U-Vibe, Vibrato, Tremolo, Voxwa, a compressor, and a treble boost. The speed and intensity are used to adjust the speed and intensity of the effect, and the on and off button to the left of that turns the pre-effect section off and on. To the right of the pre-effects, we have the amplifier section, or, or the amp simulator. This simulates various uh, vintage and historic amplifiers, and the drive knob allows you to customize the gain and the drive that the amp is running at. So if you turn it all the way up to 10, it distorts the sound and makes it sound really crazy, and if you have it at 2, it gives it a more vintage kind of a, yeah, vintage kind of an antique sort of a sound. It's kind of interesting. And of course, the on and off button turns that section on and off. As you can see, it's really pretty simple to use. In the, in the middle of the digital piano is the favorites category, which has been greatly added and improved from the original SV1. You, we now have eight different banks of sounds with eight different uh, favorite sections available in each uh, bank. So that gives us a much wider variety of sounds we can use here to set as presets and favorites for the SV2, which is really great. To the right of the favorites bank is the sound section. This is where you select the different sounds. You have the type knob and the variation knob. The type knob is to select different groups of sounds, like for example, electric pianos or acoustic pianos. And then the variation knob allows you to spin through and select which individual sound you want. You can also push on the variation knob to give you a second layer of sounds that is actually available in here as well. So there's double the amount of sounds in the SV2 than there were in the SV1, which I think is pretty fantastic as well. To the right of the sound section is the modulation section, which is an extra layer of effects you can add to the SV2. We have things such as two different types of choruses, two different types of phasers, a flanger, and a rotary speaker effect, which isn't the best, but it does have a pretty cool sound nonetheless. Um, the speed and intensity sounds um, knobs that change the speed and intensity of these effects, and the on and off switch turns that section on and off. Finally, at the very right-hand side of the instrument, we have the ambient effect and the power button. Obviously, the power button turns on and off the instrument, and the ambient effect is, or the ambient section, is various effects that you can apply to the sound as well. Different types of reverb and a type of echo and a type of delay. So that is how that works, and of course, the on and off button for that section turns it on and off. Finally, behind everything, on top of the instrument and a little bit behind the instrument, you can see the speaker grills that I mentioned earlier. I talked about them a little bit, but from the first camera angle, you really couldn't see them. So here's a different picture of the speaker grill. Honestly, I think it looks really, really cool. It's really unique and really stands out from everything else. When you see something like this up on stage, you can instantly know that it is a Korg SV2. There's nothing other like it in the world. Like it in the world. So that's been a little quick overview of the the layout of the instrument, as you can see, it's super, super simple. It doesn't take very long at all to get used to it and to figure out how it works. It's so well done and so, so great. A lot of people would say that something like this needs a screen, and you know, in 2020, we need big screens on everything. And part of me can kind of agree and see where people are coming from, but this instrument is so simple and the, lay the layout is kind of meant to, to emulate a vintage piece of equipment. These knobs are very reminiscent of musical instruments that came from the 70s and the whole experience here kind of gives an analog vibe to everything. There is a computer editor you can use um, for the SV2 as well. You can hook it up through USB and that is available for download on Korg's website, but for the most part I don't really find myself needing to use that. You can do cool things with it. You can layer and split sounds through the editor and do a number of other sweet things as well, but for the most part, I don't really find myself needing to do that, so in today's video, I won't be discussing that all that much. I think now it's about time to actually play the SV2 and give you guys a bit of a taste of what it sounds like. There are 72, if I remember correctly, different sounds here of the SV2, and you can also kind of increase that as well by creating your own favorites and customizing sounds and basically creating brand new sounds that you can set into the favorites. But what I will do is do my best to give you a taste of as many of the sounds as possible because there's so many, I don't have time to play a full song on each sound. So what I'll probably do is play a couple of chords on a couple of different sounds and just kind of quickly flip through and give you guys a taste of what each one sounds like. But for the default 
Rhodes sound. What I will do is play my little like fake Rhodes test piece here to give you guys an idea of what the default Rhodes sounds like. And then after that, I'll spin through the rest of the first EP section, give you a taste of the rest of the sounds. As you can hear in the EP1 section, you have, you have different flavors of Fender Rhodes type sounds, and the last four are different flavors of Whirly sounds, like a Whirlicher 200 type instrument. So the first EP section is kind of based around vintage instruments, and that's what the SV stands for. It stands for Stage Vintage. So many of the sounds of the SV2 are meant to emulate various vintage electro uh, electronic instruments and electromechanical instruments, many things like that. And that is what the first EP section is for. I honestly like virtually every sound of the SV2. There's a couple that I think would be difficult for me to use in music, but I still like the way they sound. And that's kind of impressive because 72 or so sounds is a lot of sounds and it's difficult to make all of them sound nice, but there's actually very few that I don't genuinely like. So I think that's pretty cool. And in the first EP section, I like all of them, to be honest with you. I'll come back to the section later and we'll mess around and see the ways we can change the various sounds and check out all the effects, but for now, let's move on to the second EP section, which has many of the same sounds and also a few new ones. There's a few different layered uh, sounds with the roads and the really layered with strings and layered with pads, and there's also some FM synthesis type sounds as well. Have a listen to everything in the EP2 section. <laughs> Thank you. 
As you can hear once again in the EP2 section, we have a number of vintage sounds, and honestly, I like all of those as well. You did hear though, I was messing around with changing between a couple of the sounds, and with a couple of them in particular, you could definitely hear that there are some volume shifts when you change sounds. In the quick guide, and I think the owner's manual as well, or it could be the other way around, it might not mention it in the quick guide, but it should mention it in the owner's manual. Korg says that um, if you're using a sound that uses the amp sim section, and you switch to and from a sound that doesn't use Use the amp sim you will hear a volume shift this actually definitely is true and I can see why it would be difficult to get it to not be that case you know what I mean it would be difficult to have it not change in sound because if you have the gain turned way up on the amp sim it radically increases the sound understandably however in the EP2 section in, especially in the B category, nothing is actually using the amp sim, and also I don't think anything in the, yeah, nothing in the EP2 section at all is using the amp sim. You'd see this light up if something was using the amp sim, and as you can see, nothing is. So, but yet there's still volume shifts, especially when you're on uh, B4, and you switch between B4 and A4, you'll hear the difference. <laughs> It's not even like B4 and A4 are radically different in volume. If you play one and then you play the other, you'll hear that they don't really sound all that much louder, but yet when you switch between the two, one of them suddenly becomes radically louder. I also think there was a difference between um, switching between one and two with some of the um, FM synthesis type sounds, which by the way are absolutely fantastic. I'm honestly not a massive fan of the sounds of the Yamaha DX. They were a bit before my time and sound a bit dated, but I really like the sounds in the SV2. They really sound awesome and fun to play. And I think that's probably one of the biggest takeaways from this video is that the SV2 is really fun to play and I really love playing it even though it's not 100% perfect. Let's move on to the acoustic piano category now and now I will play some classical style music and my treble test piece and a couple of other things as well. The first piano here in this section uh, Korg says is a German grand so let's see how that sounds with a bit of Claire de Lune. So that's the sound of the German Grand, and as you can hear, it's pretty warm and mellow sounding. I definitely like the sound of the acoustic pianos in the SV2. They're not perfect, however. I think that the German Grand, for some reason, has this strange effect of making the notes kind of decay faster. It's very strange, and I can't really prove or really explain what's going on here, but when I play a single chord and listen to it decay, it sounds perfectly normal and excellent, but yet when I'm playing music and I'm playing, like, say, an arpeggio in the left hand, then I have a, a note in the right hand I want to sing out above it it kind of decays into the rest of the notes faster than I feel I would like, which is a bit strange. And also in the mid-range, high treble kind of area of the instrument, the it doesn't sing out as much as I would like to. Some of this can be fixed though with the EQ that's built right into the SV2. Here's a preset I came up with that kind of makes these this instrument, the same exact piano, come out and make be a bit brighter and a little bit more lively. I'll play the same passage here for you.
If you were performing live at a gig and you needed to have a brighter piano sound to punch through the mix, you could simply EQ one of the default pianos and get it to sound a bit brighter, which is honestly pretty fantastic. There's a number of different variants of the piano. Uh, the second category is a Italian grand, according to Korg. The third gra uh, variety is a Japanese grand. And the fourth section there is a, what was it? Austrian Grand, that was it. So you've got a few different uh, pianos that supposedly are from all around the world and have a different sound. While they do sound a little bit different, I really wouldn't say that number two sounds like a Fazioli or that number three sounds like a Yamaha or a Kawai or that number four really sounds like a Busendorfer. If anything, number four reminds me more of a Steinway than it does a Busendorfer. However, they are different piano sounds and they do have a different flavor. So let me go back to number one. I'll play B1 as well, which is a different variant of the German Grand. And then I'll scroll through and play a little bit on each of the other pianos. So that was a taste of all of the acoustic pianos of the SV2, and now I think it's time to move on to the second category of acoustic pianos. Before I do that, however, I think I want to talk about a couple more things regarding the acoustic piano sounds, and one of those is the action, actually, as a matter of fact, because when you're playing a real acoustic piano, the action is a vital part of playing that instrument, and the action is also a vital part of playing a digital piano as well, and since I'm on the topic of the acoustic pianos, I thought it might be a good time to segue into talking about the action. The action of the SV2 is Korg's RH3L. There's a little sticker even at the top of the key that shows what type of action it is, and this is an action that Korg has been using for over a decade. It was found in the original SV1. It can be found in Korg's D1. It can be found in the grand stage, and I think also there Kronos as well, and probably a few other models that I'm not aware of as well. A lot of people, I believe, at least among themselves, have been saying that Korg should update the action and come out with a new version of the RH3, come out with an RH4, or come out with something different, stop using the same action for 10 or so years. But let me just say that there's a reason that the, S the, the RH3 action has been used for over 10 years, and that's because it's a really good action. A lot of people, I think, might just want change just to have something different, but I think that RH3 is honestly pretty good. I'm sure there are improvements that could be made, but for general playing and even for classical music, there's really no issue at all. I would definitely put Korg's RH3 action definitely in the top three um, digital piano actions made today, at least the ones that I have played. I have no problems whatsoever playing it. It's it's a joy to play, honestly. It, the dynamic response is excellent. The tactile feel and feedback of the keys is really, really great. And the way the action just feels is really fantastic. And it's honestly wonderful to play. You can play anything from jazz and pop music on it to actually advanced classical music. A couple of years ago, before I went to the NAMM show, I wanted to play the Pirates of the Caribbean theme. And what did I practice on it when I was at home? Well, to keep time off of my real piano, I practiced on a digital piano and I practice it on the SV2. And if you guys know Jared Radnich's version of Pirates of the Caribbean, it's a pretty bombastic piece, and this can handle it just fine. So it can tolerate many hours of very hard playing and be honestly perfectly fine. Now, I have heard people say and 
I have seen pictures of SV1s with broken keys and Korg D1s with broken keys, and they use the RH3 action. So I'm not exactly sure what exactly causes these actions to break. I think a lot of it just comes from damage. Like if you drop it, it'll break. Um, I've seen the pictures online of actually the keys and what happens to them. I guess if they get hit hard enough, the part that keeps the key from coming all the way out just shears off and then you have a broken key. I believe they're pretty easy to fix though. If you take it apart and manage to get inside of the action, you can replace the physical plastic keys. Um, so there is some sort of an issue there, but I don't think it will come apart or come by. The issue won't happen just from normal regular playing. I think it actually has to be abused and be dropped and crashed for it to actually break because I haven't had any issues with my original SV1. The other thing I wanted to discuss with the piano sounds is the damper noise that I'm sure you heard in the piano pieces. Let me just, just play the damper pedal and hopefully you guys can hear it. As you can hear, it's honestly not the greatest sound of a piano's dampers lifting up off the strings, and also I find it to be a bit loud. However, there's a really fantastic fix for this that I'm really glad Korg has worked into the SV2. If you push the function button right down here, which I forgot to mention in my overview of the user interface, by the way, you'll see that a few lights of the instrument start to blink, including the EQ buttons. You'll have the bass, the mid, and the treble EQ sometimes all blinking, but in this case, we only have the bass and the mid. The reason they're blinking is because these have now actually become a mixer and there's two layers to the acoustic piano sound even the ones that don't have a strings pad behind them that second layer is the ambient noise of the action noise the damper noise and a few other things as well in some of the other sounds you can take this knob and you can actually use it to turn down those sounds or if you push and hold on it you'll see that that light goes out and you can actually completely remove the ambient noise. And now I think the acoustic piano, for me at least, is a lot more enjoyable to listen to. Here's the default German Grand once more. Of course, if you still want to have the damper sound, you can push and hold this button and simply use it as a mixer and turn the damper sound a little bit lower, which I could have also done as well. Now, I think a small little improvement could be made to this section as well. Instead of having to push and hold the knob instead to turn it on and off, it would be kind of cool if you could tap on the knob just like this to turn it on and off. The reason that's not the case is because pushing on the knob once resets the value of each sound to its original position where the factory wants it to be. If that was swapped though, if you pushed and held on it to reset the factory value and you pushed on it once to turn it on and off, I think that might make for a little bit of an improvement because then if you wanted to mess with it live in scenario, you could just push the function button just like that and then tap on it or spin it to quickly make an adjustment instead of having to keep your hand on it for a good second or so. That would be a small improvement to make, but still, I really like the, the fact that S Korg has included that in the SV2 because it really makes for a bit of extra customization. I'll talk more about the customization of the sounds that you can do a little bit later on in the video, but I think for now I want to wrap up with the rest of the sounds and briefly go through the second section of the piano. This features a lot of a few other different electric and electromechanical types of pianos, as well as a few combos. So if you've got pianos layered with strings and pianos layered with pads and a few other cool things. Let's check it out.
we have a few fun variants of CP80 type sounds and a few different pianos layered with pads and some of those are really really cool. Now a couple of them those really ethereal ambient piano sounds mixed with the pads might be difficult to use at least for me in music but I do think they sound really cool. So once again I like just about everything in the, uh, the piano 2 category. In the clavier sound, the clavier section, uh, it contains clavinet sounds, harpsichord sounds, and organ sounds. It's interesting that it's called clavier, but regardless, that's what the name is. It's not called clavi or clav, it's clavier. Um, so for the first four sounds here are clavinet sounds. Let's have a listen to those. Once again, you can hear the key click noise of the clavinet sounds is very, very loud, but once again, like with the acoustic piano sounds and also the electric pianos too, you can hit the function button and then you'll see that these two lights are flashing. This is the actual clavinet sound and this is the key click noise. So you can turn it down or even turn it all the way off. I do like the idea of having key click noise with the clavinet. It was that kind of an instrument that would have kind of extraneous noises. So I think I would just turn it down and that would suit me a little bit better. So once again, it's great that that is a feature you can go in there and modify those sounds. The third section here is two different variants of a harpsichord. Have a listen to that. Interestingly, the harpsichord also has key click noises, but these ones are actually built into the instrument. I have the function button hit, and as you can see, the mid EQ button is not blinking. So with the harpsichord, you can't actually turn off those noises. Not that big of a deal, though, because the harpsichord, again, was also a very noisy instrument, and it definitely has a lot of that type of key click noise and action sounds as well. Uh, if we move on here, let me exit out of the function menu. If we move on here, we have four different, or actually six different organ sounds. I do have to turn the volume down for these, though, because they are considerably louder than the rest of the sounds. I will try to avoid doing comparisons between the SV-1 here, but I do have to mention that the SV-1 also had this issue, and the SV-2 also has this issue. The organ sounds are far louder than the rest of the instruments. However, I do have to say that I think the rest of the sounds, for the most part, are a bit more balanced out. I remember with the old SV-1, the EPs were much louder than the acoustic pianos, and now those are a bit more balanced out, I think, so that is good. The organs, though, still are much louder. Have a listen, though, to the first four organs. Three of them are tone wheel type organs, and the fourth one is a combo type organ, like a Vox Continental. Those are the four tone wheel and combo organ sounds, and honestly, I do kind of like them. Uh, number four B is kind of like a gritty tone wheel style organ, and then I think it was five B was a uh, combo type type organ, which honestly sounded pretty nice as well. Six uh, A and six B are two different types of pipe organ sounds, and they both sound pretty decent. Have a listen.
But let's be there is a new Bach fugue that I'm working on, and it's a lot of fun to play, but obviously I'm not finished with it yet. Uh, so those are the two pipe organ sounds, and honestly, they're both pretty good. The second one is like a more delicate flute sound that's a bit better for percussive music, and uh, not percussive, but, you know, quick staccato music. And the first one is a big full pipe organ that's better for long sustained notes. If I were to try to play that fugue on the first pipe organ, you'd hear that it sounds pretty wonky. However, having said that, that pipe organ is really fantastic for big, low, sustained chords, and one thing I like is that as you keep going down lower into the register, it's not just a pitch-shifted version of the keys above it, you actually, the tone actually changes and you start to get the sound of an actual 32-foot, like, pipe organ would have when you play those low notes. Obviously, I'm not saying it's the same as a pipe organ, but it definitely does sound kind of like a recording of one. I think the pipe organ sound is a little bit shrill uh, for the direct signal. The speakers, while they are very nice and do have a big full sound. Um, they do seem to cut off a lot of the high partials and also some of the low as well. So when I'm playing the uh, big pipe organ, it sounds a bit more mellow, and in the direct signal it sounds a bit shriller, but you can use the EQ and dial back the mids and the highs to make it sound a bit more normal and a little bit less shrill. Having said that, I really do like those two pipe organ sounds, and I think they're both pretty awesome. Um, I think if Korg were able to improve the staccato performance of the first pipe organ, they'd really have something to talk about. Uh, but other than that, I still love the pipe organ sound. In the Others category, we have um, 12 different Others sounds, and these are kind of miscellaneous orchestral sounds and string pads, and there's a few really cool ones in here. So have a listen to the first two string pads, which are some of my favorite string orchestral pads of any digital piano. Typically, I'm not a big fan of them, but the ones Korg is using are pretty good. I really enjoy that. Um, number 2A here of the others category is like a Mellotron, like a tape strings type of sound. And 2B is this really cool pad that's got a strings pad layered with the synth pad layered with a female choir voice. And it all comes together to be this really beautiful sound. Like with the clavinet and acoustic piano sounds where you can actually go in there and see the different layered sounds and alter them, you can actually do the same thing with many of the other sounds of the piano as well. If we hit function here on that really cool synth pad, you'll see that all three EQ buttons now light up because there's three different layers. One's another small improvement I'd like to see made to this, uh, this system, we use these as a mixing thing, is if you push and hold two of them down at once, only one of them will actually turn off. That'd be cool if both of them turned off when you pushed two of them down at once, but that's a small little thing. Now I have the, I think it's gonna be the female choir, it should be isolated. So that I think is really cool that you're able to go in there and split and layer and change the different sounds of the actual instruments that are preset into the piano. I think that's really cool. You can go in there and change that. It's just another level of customization that the SV2 has that makes it really versatile and really fun to play. Up next in the others category is, I actually don't even remember what's going to be next, so let's find out together. <laughs> So that was just a couple of synth pads that are there on um, A3 and B3, but it's number four where things get really cool. 
Let's have a listen to A4, which is a big brass section with timpanis and octave pianos and cool bass drums. It's really, really fantastic. That sounds absolutely stunning, and I really, really love that sound. It's really expressive, and as you move down the keyboard, things actually begin to change and evolve. So you've got different sections that have a slightly different sound. With certain things, that would annoy me to have the sound shift and completely change as you move up and down the keyboard, but it makes a lot of sense with this particular sound. Up in the higher treble, you have the brass mixed with kind of a synth pad, which you actually don't have control, I think, over the synth pad, but you have control over the brass, the timpani, and the piano, I think, as well. So I'll go in there and check that out. Um, but up in the treble, you have the brass and the synth, and as you move down, this octave piano starts to come in, and then after a couple notes, you get the timpani added into the octave piano and the brass, and as you keep moving down and down and down, these three notes become this big boomy bass drum and then below that it's a really low synth growly sound so let me split these up and i'll just go down the scale and you can see what's happening here actually yeah there's only two different uh, sections there's not a third layer so there you don't have control over one of the things there's like four or five different layers and you don't have control over all of them but you can still go in there and split up some of them so let's mess around with that So there we go, that was kind of me messing around with the that particular sound and splitting it up. So as you can see, you don't have control over everything. You've got one type of brass and a strings pad layered together as one that you cannot separate. And you also have a, I think the uh, the timpani was in there as well and you can't isolate that. Would have been really cool if the timpani was its own separate file that you could have isolated and used on its own. but. Oh well, it's still a really fantastic sound. And 4B is another absolutely fantastic symphonic type sound. I can turn the volume back up a bit for this one. Have a listen to this. It's one of my favorites. <laughs> Unlike the last one we just saw, if I hit function, you'll see that all three EQ things will start to blink, and that means I have control over the pizzicato strings, the slow strings, and the glockenspiel that's mixed in there too. So 
So that's an added layer of control that you have over the sound, which I really, really love. Let's move on to five and six, which I believe are just a few different types of pads, and that will wrap up all of the different sounds of the SV2. I actually managed to do it. I played every single sound for you guys. So there you have it. Those are all of the sounds of the Korg SV2, and I've got to be honest with you, I like virtually all of them. There's very, very few of them that I don't genuinely love, and with a digital piano that has this many sounds, almost 100, getting up into that 100 sound category, some of the digital pianos I've reviewed, which arguably have had even more than this, but some of the ones I've played that have had a lot of sounds, a lot of the ones in there are cheesy and not great sounding, but with the SV2, they're all, at least in my opinion, really great sounding. Maybe there's a couple that aren't phenomenal, but there's many, many, almost all of them are absolutely amazing and so much fun to play. And once again, I come back to that. The SV2 is fun to play around with. I saw a comment somebody made on a video I did of a Roland Atelier organ, and they said that the issue with it is you didn't play the organ, you played with the organ. The SV2 is kind of the same way. When I sit down to play it, I do find myself playing the piano and practicing on it, but I find myself playing around with it more, especially because it's new and I'm still exploring how it works and the different things I can do with it. So so it's so much fun to see, oh, how does this classical piece sound with this electric piano sound? Or how does this piece sound with this synth sound? And just messing around and composing new pieces that sound cool on the new sounds. And it's just so much fun to play. It really, really is. And part of that is because, like I've mentioned several times now, is the control you have over the sound. I think I want to explore that a little bit and just show you guys the range of control you have with the sound. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the default EP, the electric piano sound, the road sound, and just see how we can morph it and just spend a couple of minutes playing around with that. So the first thing we can do to change the sound of it is we can hit the touch sensitivity button and then the favorites buttons will light up. One through eight are different levels of touch sensitivity. One is normal. I think two through five are kind of varying degrees of light. So two is the lightest, three is a little bit less light, four is somewhere in the middle, and then five through seven start to get increasingly heavier and eight is no touch sensitivity at all. The very first thing I can do to change the sound of this EP is to push the second touch sensitivity button and now we have a much brighter, punchier sound. Have a listen. So just pushing that one button definitely changes the sound of the electric piano a lot. Something else we can do is come over here to the pre-effects section and play with this and mess around with that. Like I said, there are six different types of effects and you can change the speed and intensity of them. I think maybe we'll go with a Vox Wah, but I think I'll play around with a couple of the other ones too, but I think I want to try out the Wah effect for this one. You can see already how much that changes the sound of that Fender Rhodes. It's just so much different now. Something else we can do is we can go to the amp sim and we can increase the gain of that. What the amp sim is going to do is add some background hiss to kind of emulate like a vintage amp that's not quite working properly. And also it's going to add some grit and distortion to this as well. What I think I'm going to do is turn the master volume down and crank that gain way the heck up all the way up to 10. And now let's see how our little Rhodes piano sounds now. It's 
completely different from the sound of the original Fender Rhodes. And then I can even modulate it further if I wanted to by going into the modulation tab and adding a chorus or a phaser or something like that. Maybe I'll add a phaser and we'll turn the intensity down to make it nice and subtle. And now we have this type of sound. <laughs> So you have a massive, massive amount of control over the SV2 sounds, and I'm not necessarily saying that this is the ideal sound for everyone, or even that it necessarily sounds good. I'm sure many of you absolutely hate that sound. But what I am trying to prove here is that you have a massive amount of control, and you can completely, completely transform the sound of the original instrument. Keep in mind that that crazy, wacky sound came from a Fender Rhodes, which sounded like this. So we turned that simple, cute sounding Fender Rhodes into this really growly, gritty monstrosity of a sound that is a lot of fun to play with as well. So you have a massive amount of control over the sound of the SV2 and that in itself makes it so much fun to play. As a bit of a wrap up, the SV2 is a unique, interesting digital piano that is a lot of fun to play. It has a very unique appearance and so you're going to look really cool up on stage with it and it has a massive amount of really fantastic sounds that you can go through and customize and change. You can set favorites and create your own special custom sounds that you like for your own purposes and the action of it is absolutely fantastic to play on as well. The user interface, the user experience, the playing experience, and the visual appearance of it as well all come together to create a really fantastic digital piano. I think there are a few small things that Korg could have improved on, for example, the way the EQ works a little bit, the, um, not the EQ, but you know, when you're mixing and changing the sounds, that I think could be tweaked a little bit. The pedal unit, I think, could use a bit of an upgrade by now, you know, it's 2020, the Kawaii ES-110, a $500, $600 digital piano, comes with a better pedal, in my opinion, than the one that comes with the Korg. It's heavier duty and it sticks to the floor better, but regardless, the pedal unit does work. And there's a couple of other things in here that I would have liked to see an, seen an improvement on, but overall, the SV2 is fantastic, and I absolutely love playing it. It's just really wonderful, and I do think it has made a very good successor to the original SV1. Some things have been changed about the SV2 to the SV1 that I wasn't really expecting, and I will do a full bone, full bone review of it to kind of uh, show you guys what those changes are. But overall, I love the SV2. I think it's equally as fun, if not more fun, to play than the original SV1, and I really, really love it. I hope you guys have enjoyed this video I've done of the Korg SV2S. There's, I've had a lot of requests for this instrument, but like I said, it's been very, very difficult to get. Not very many people have been able to get their hands on an SV2, never mind the SV2S, which seems to be the very, very rare variant of the SV2. Honestly, I'm very happy with it, and honestly, the speakers do do a very good job. They're very loud and they need to be, and they also have some nice subtleties to them as well. I do think they are chopping off a lot of the high end, especially with some of the sounds, like again, that pipe organ sounds a lot more mellow through the speakers than it does the direct line signal. But honestly, I'm pretty happy with the speakers as well, and I do like them as well. They're doing a nice job. So I do hope that you guys have enjoyed this video. If you did, you might want to go check out my channel. I've got lots of cool videos of pianos, organs, digital pianos, acoustic pianos, and all kinds of other piano-related things. So if any of that sounds cool, you might want to go check out my channel. And if you want to, you can think about subscribing. If you do all that, thank you very much, and I'll see you in the next video. Goodbye.